ending today. Thought so too. Roger Zelazny. And Zelazny is noted for his combining together of science fiction with mythology. And early on in this series, I talked about his uh, science fiction Hall of Fame story, A Rose for Ecclesiastes. And the, uh, the image from the magazine cover uh, painted by Hans Bach, who I talked about earlier, is uh, a picture of Brax of the Martian holding a rose that has been given to her by an earthman who has fallen in love with her. And, uh, and she, through the whole story, has been sent as a, a, a seductive being to draw the human earthman male poet linguist into uh, uh, sex. X, so the uh, Martian race will be uh, rejuvenated, which is dwindling in population. And in, in this story, which Zelazny wrote in 1963, uh, he brings in uh, the uh, uh, philosophy of Ecclesiastes from the Old Testament, and he connects it up with science fiction. And he would repeatedly take ancient myths and stories and philosophies and mix them together with science fiction. Now, here's a number, and there's more up that he did than is even up here, of his uh, uh, better known uh, uh, science fiction novels and stories. Uh, Damnation Alley, they perverted it, uh, was a very good novel and when they made it into a movie. Uh, uh, he Who Shapes, which won the Nebula for Best Science Fiction Novel of the Year, is about a man who uh, is able to go into the mind, a psychiatrist who's able to go in the minds of his patients and gets drawn into the madness of one of his patients. And that won the Nebula for Best Science Fiction Novel of the Year. This Immortal, which also won uh, a Best Science Fiction Novel of the Year, is um, um, another fascinating tale. The one he is uh, frequently remembered for among his novels, which really crosses the bridge between science fiction and fantasy, or science fiction and religion, really, is Lord of Light, which takes place in the distant future where a group of humans who are very technologically advanced have settled on this alternate world, this other planet, and in order to protect themselves against the dangers of living on this planet through high technologies, have transformed themselves into the Hindu deities, possessing all of the powers of these deities. So in the story, we have Shiva, and we have Brahma, and we have um, uh, maybe 15 or 20 different deities, and we also have a technologically uh, 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 generated um, uh, uh, persona of the Buddha. And, um, and so all of these supernatural powers we're able to achieve in the future through advanced technologies. But the story actually centers around the Buddha's attempt to overturn the hierarchical caste system of the Hindu techno deities and to bring equality and freedom to everybody and not just that select few who are um, uh, 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 who have all of these godlike powers. Uh, so, so the story reads as a story of the quest for uh, and the battle for freedom against religious oppression and of inequality, but it's informed by um, Hindu uh, uh, mythology. Um, the Keys to December is about a human who's been genetically and biologically re-engineered as a, uh, a cat beam who is adapted to super cold temperatures and terraforms the world 
and in doing so generates or stimulates the evolution of beings who live on that world and eventually gets treated as a god by those beings on that world that he has stimulated their evolution. It's a very, very moving tale. Um, and uh, the last, and Home, Home is the Hangman is another very good novel, which I really liked and I read it back then to, to recommend. Um, but the one by Zale and also I should put up here, The Great Book of Amber, <clears throat> which was 10 novels <clears throat> that he wrote a bit later in his life that are more pure fantasy, but became actually his most commercially successful novels. Um, and he turned more to fantasy as uh, uh, he, he got on in years from writing science fiction early on. But the one by Zelazny, the story by Zelazny that I like best was For a Breath I Teary. And it took place in some distant future time on Earth where humanity had long become extinct and we have a computer that's shaped like a box, a cube named Frost. And Frost is trying to understand humans and what it means to have feelings, sensations, and to generate art. And Frost is involved in this ongoing experimentation of trying to create art. And he has this little robot who helps him out through the whole thing. Uh, and at the end of the novel, Frost decides that the only way to know what it was to be human and to understand what art and sensuality mean is, is to create a new human, a human body, and to inject his consciousness into that human body. And so that he won't be alone in this process, the other supercomputer on the earth, Beta, he makes a female body for her and they wake up at the end in human bodies. It's a very moving poetical tale. And another thing you could say about Zelazny was Zelazny was a beautiful writer, a very lyrical and uh, exceedingly imaginative in his scenarios. Uh, so he was my second one that was a favorite, and he is frequently identified as one of the four or five key writing figures of the new wave. Now here comes my third favorite, Philip Jose Farmer, the one I had quoted at the beginning from Writers of the Purple Wage. Now the first thing that Farmer be became famous for was sex, and Farmer did more for sex and science fiction than anybody else. Back in the 1950s and early 60s, he wrote two classic, highly sexual science fiction novels, The Lovers and Flesh. And The Lovers is about a insect species on another planet that is able to mimic any invasive species to seduce them so that it can reproduce. And this human is seduced by an insect who takes on the form of a beautiful woman. And the world in which this human lives is an extremely repressive Christian fundamentalist future human society. In flesh, a human is captured by future earth inhabitants who are matriarchal and have a goddess religion. And this human is surgically implanted with giant antlers on its head, which are filled with sex hormones and has sex with thousands of women on this island to perpetuate, not this island, this future earth, in order to perpetuate the species, the human species. And uh, so it, both novels would be considered in the 1950s as pornographic for sure. Uh, he wrote some other really great ones along the way like Night of Light and The World, The Tears, which are highly imaginative, 
Strange Relations, which contains four stories. The first one, Mother, which is about a human that gets trapped inside of the belly of an alien and is, is served by that alien and eventually kind of has this sexual osmosis with the alien. Um, and then he wrote in 1967, which came out in uh, Dangerous Visions, Writers of the Purple Wage, which was unequivocally the best story in that uh, uh, series of three novels. And Writers of the Purple Wage is one of the most literary, inventive, colorful, bizarre, filled with all of this play on language and puns. It contains famous lines like, one man's nightmare is another man's wet dream. And there are universes begging for gods yet he hangs around this one looking for work. It plays on a future welfare state in which we have a character, a young kid, who is a member of the Young Radishes. That's the group whose mother is this obese woman who sits at a table with her friends and plays poker all the time, addicted to gambling, while he creates three-dimensional art, including this blasphemous image of uh, Christ in the manger, and is trying to become a world-renowned artist through this process. And in one scene in the story, one of his lovers, a female, uh, tells him that they could have intercourse. And then she starts screaming when he starts to do it or afterwards that she never wanted to do it. And so when she, she puts some, uh, a tube that's injecting uh, um, uh, a um, uh, sperm killing drug up into her vagina, he glues it in there with crazy glue and she fills up the whole house with uh, foam from the, uh, um, uh, the sperm killing drug. It's a lunatic of a story, but it's incredibly inventive with, with its language. And uh, 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 the other day I had been recommending to Jeannie that she read it and she finally got around to starting to read it and Jeannie can make some comments as she wants. But I would highly recommend that story as emblematic of the new wave both in terms of style, color, breaking taboos, offending any kind of conservative values one may have. And then a couple of years later, he writes his most famous novel series, the River World series. And the first novel in the series, To, to, to Your Scattered Bodies Go, begins on a river, on an immense world where every human who has ever existed wakes up on the river, all of them hairless and naked and having no idea how they all got there. And so it's an amazingly inventive starting point. And we have Prince John and Mark Twain and all a variety of other very famous people in history participating in this four volume saga. Uh, and they eventually build a riverboat to travel up the river of this gigantic world to try to find who it is that's brought them all back from the dead. And then Philip Jose Farmer got crazy. And what he did toward the end was he created this storyline in which he proposed that Tarzan and Doc Savage who was a famous uh, comic book character back from uh, the 1930s and 40s, were actually real people who had been affected by this astronomic event and had been transformed into these superhuman characters who show up in fiction and, it, and actually gave birth to Sherlock Holmes, Dr. Moriarty, and numerous other, uh, oh, James Bond to numerous other famous fictional characters. And at the beginning, to offend people even more in terms of sexual taboos, the two central characters end up wrestling with each other, males, and both of them with erections, 
because these two central characters to begin with cannot get sexually aroused except in relationships involving violence. So Farmer just went all over the place for 40 or 50 years, wrote incredibly imaginative stuff, uh, uh, really uh, uh, offended everybody uh, outside of the conservative, um, outside in conservative uh, population in terms of his visions of sex and brought sex into science fiction, which hadn't really much been there before. Now, the next one that was a significant figure in American New Wave science fiction was Samuel Chip Delaney. Now, here's three images of Samuel Delaney. The first one strumming a guitar when he's young, about 18, 19 years old. And he was part of a rock group that lived in a commune, having grown up in Harlem and moving to Greenwich Village. The second image is of him at the age of 20 or 21 years old, winning his first nebula for his uh, novel, Babel 17. And then the third one where he's grown a beard now, immersed in books all surrounding him because he eventually becomes a professor of creative writing and literature at Temple University, even though he only had one semester of college education. I got to listen to him in person at a science fiction convention, and he was an extremely articulate, intelligent person. He was one of the first black science fiction writers to achieve any kind of fame and recognition, and clearly was seen as a great architect in the new wave. Now, to blow your mind, here is Chip Delaney about 10 years ago. Grew a long white beard, swelled up in size, and again, is surrounded by books. And he's actually had two different careers. I will come to this quote, to wound the autumnal city, so howled out for the world to give him a name, period, I have come to. And what is that? I'll tell you in a second. <clears throat> right at the beginning, he won uh, two awards for best uh, science fiction novel, Nebula Hugo, for Babel 17 and the Einstein Intersection. I read both of them. I thought they were pretty good. But the one that stuck in my mind was Dahlgren. And Dahlgren um, was one of the biggest selling science fiction novels of all time, selling over a million copies. And it's very strange that it would have been such a big seller. It's very new wave. But in a sense, it's incomprehensible. It's like 800 pages long, and it begins with a character walking into this city, undefined, with one sandal, hearkening back to Greek mythology. And the opening line in the novel is to wound the autumnal city, so howled out for the world to give him a name, period. That's the beginning of the novel. And he goes into this city, which is disintegrating, ruled by gangs. And he meets these women who give him a notebook. And when he opens up the notebook, what you find in the notebook are excerpts from the novel that you, the reader, are actually reading right now. And along the way, through the story, he has sex with guys, has sex with girls, gets beat up by a gang, becomes the leader of the gang. One day, out of the blue, the sun rises up in the morning and is swollen, gigantic, and huge, and red. And another morning, two moons arise. Buildings burn and never deteriorate. And he keeps writing in this book. And he has amnesia. He doesn't know his name. He doesn't know who he is. Is. And as the novel progresses, you begin to see this interweaving together of him, a character in the novel, writing the book that he's a character in the novel of that you were reading. And at the end, he leaves the city. And the final line in the novel is, I have come to. 
The end of the novel is the beginning of the sentence that's at the beginning of the novel. And it's a very memorable uh, a, a story. In one level, it doesn't seem to make any sense, but it really plays on your head. And it's filled with a lot of inventive literary style. And then he got into writing about science fiction. He moved from being more of a science fiction writer to being a science fiction scholar. And a lot of his more recent publications have been around writing science fiction. Um, uh, one of them I'll mention here is, uh, where is it? Oh yeah, right. Uh, the Motion of Light in Water, Sex and Science Fiction Writing in the East Village. And it became apparent as time went along from him be, when he was young that he was bisexual. And in this, uh, a semi, uh, in this somewhat autobiographical uh, uh, study of the writing of science fiction, he talks about his sexual experiences. He talks about his experiences with being part of a rock group in Heavenly Breakfast. And he talks about you know, the writing of science fiction as a form of art of speculative fiction. And he's made a name for himself both then as a science fiction writer and as a, a, a nonfiction writer and professor of uh, creative writing and science fiction. But he was another big name in the new wave during the late 1960s into the 1970s. Now, the next writer who I have on my list of my favorite writers of the period was Robert Silverberg. And Robert Silverberg wrote over 100 science fiction novels during his career. He's still alive. I met him finally a couple of years ago. But early on in his career, he wrote roughly 200 erotic novels to make money to survive while living in New York City where he became friends with Harlan Ellison. And he actually started writing back in the mid 1950s. Now, after, the, after his, this huge outpouring of writing that he did in the 1950s, where he was recognized as uh, the most promising new author in 1956 in science fiction, he stopped writing science fiction for about five or six years. And then in the middle to late 1960s, he produced the most intense, sustained series of very good science fiction novels over a period of just about five or six years. And Tons of them were nominated for Hugos and Nebulas, and some of them won, but he was amazingly prol prolific with science fiction novels and with stories during the early years of the new wave. And his stories deal with time travel, overpopulation, penal institutions where you sent for punishment, um, uh, and, uh, 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 different kinds of um, uh, cultural uh, revolutions that go on. And another thing about him is he didn't stick with the same kind of themes. He jumped all over the place throughout his stories, uh, traveling into outer space and, and uh, psychic vampires. <clears throat> and so uh, in, uh, starting in 1967, he really went on this role. And I really loved him. Now, Four of his novels of that period, I think, are about equal in quality as my favorites. Now, other people might identify other ones, but the four that I identify as the best that he wrote of that period were Son of Man, The Book of Skulls, Dying Inside, and Tower of Glass. The line up there from uh, at the top comes from The Son of Man. This is new age, new, not new age, new wave writing. Night is coming on, the waters hurry. He is dismembered, disintegrated, dispersed, dissected, disjoined, dissociated, disunited, disrupted, divorced, detached, divided. That's from Son of Man. And the Son of Man takes place billions of years in the future. 
we're a human from today in a new way version of last and first men goes vastly ahead in time to meet and commune and have sex with, and this is an extremely pornographic novel, with all different versions of future humans, of which there were many. In the Book of Skulls, four college students go on a trek in Arizona to this location where the promise of immortality is there if they go through certain ancient rites, but they've been told at the beginning that in order to achieve mortality, one of the four must sacrifice himself to death and the other one must be killed. So of the four, only two are going to achieve immortality and they go on this trek. Very psychologically interesting novel. Dying inside is also psychologically interesting because it's about a telepath who is losing his power and it becomes a metaphor on all of us deteriorating and losing and aging and losing our minds. A lot of people think that that was Silverberg's best novel. And the Tower of, ba of the Tower of Glass is a retelling of the story of the Tower of Babel in which in the future we have this very rich man who has his android slaves build a, a gigantic tower of glass to communicate with aliens. And at the end of it, the androids, because they realize they're simply being used and are not treated with any kind of respect, the androids destroy the tower. Those I think were his four best. They're all very, very good, very uh, uh, representative, at least son of man dying inside the book of skulls of new wave uh, uh, writing. Oops. Got a little pop there. Okay. Uh, he also wrote a little bit later on three other novels that get nominated for uh, best novels of the year Shadrach and the Furnace, The Stochastic Man, about somebody who could predict the future in a big debate about free will and determinism, and then Lord Valentine's Castle. Uh, those all come a little bit later. Uh, his short stories are collected together in four volumes. The collected stories of Robert Silverberg. Um, and uh, in one of them, Breckenridge and the Continuum, one of the stories he wrote in the early 1970s, involves a far future world in which there's a discussion of how science fiction actually emerges out of the recombining together of myths. And he also edited something like 70 different anthologies uh, uh, while he was uh, 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 a, a productive science fiction writer. So Silverberg was unquestionably one of the most productive science fiction writers of the 20th century uh, and uh, uh, clearly wrote stuff in, in the new wave tradition. Uh, but was writing all the way from 1950, uh, uh, and he still does some stuff even now. So he was a definite favorite of mine associated with the new wave. And you can even get a book uh, where it's an autobiography, you know, the, um, uh, his uh, biography of himself, uh, which is uh, uh, titled, um, what is it? Other Spaces of it, Other Times, A Life's spent in the future. Now, here's where we come to another interesting character, Thomas Dish. Thomas Dish has three novels which are listed in the best science fiction novels of 1950 to 1985. And the three are all very good, Concentra uh, uh, Camp Concentration, 334, and On the Wings of Song. And here is Thomas Dish in front of a bunch of his novels that he wrote. And <clears throat> 334 is my favorite. Now, other people will say On Wings of Song is their favorite. Those two are highly regarded. The Genocide is the story about aliens coming to the Earth and deciding that they need to fumigate the Earth because uh, we're interfering with their uh, 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 agricultural efforts to. Uh, uh, supply themselves with food. Uh, and it's a very dark telling kind of story. Uh, camp concentration is a, uh, a, a camp in the future where people are sent 
who uh, are turned into geniuses with the drawback that this drug that they're given after a year kills them. 334 is an apartment complex in an overcrowded New York City, and it's a very uh, 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 great story about uh, uh, the whole issue of overpopulation and how bleak everything could become. On the Wings of Song is about people who, by taking a, 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 um, a drug, uh, uh, believe that they can fly, and this offends the religious right in, um, in this hypothetical future world. Uh, and Dish was raised as a Catholic and, in fact, was very uh, critical of uh, his uh, Catholic uh, uh, upbringing. And, in fact, uh, the um, uh, last uh, novel he wrote, he pretends to be God, the word of God. And that is a very interesting novel uh, because uh, in there he talks about the fact that um, he was, in reality, very good friends with Philip K. Dick. And Philip K. Dick ended up in 1972, I think, writing a letter to the FBI saying there was a secret encoded message in camp concentration, the novel, and that Dish should be arrested. And so Dick, after being friends with Dish, uh, generated great hostility in, in, in Dish over this betrayal and Dish and the Word of God throws Philip K. Dick into hell, where he develops writer's block as the punishment for Dick turning Dish into a um, uh, to the FBI. And along the way, uh, Dish also wrote, which was made into a movie, The Brave Little Toaster. <laughs> so Dish was a very prolific and very interesting writer uh, in. Uh, uh, the um, uh, anthology uh, England Sweden Science Fiction, there is a story by him in there called The Squirrel Cage. And in The Squirrel Cage, we have a writer in a cubicle room with a typewriter, but no paper, sitting on a stool that also functions as a toilet by picking up the seat. And no one ever talks to him. He doesn't know how long he's ever been there. Every day, a new issue of the New York Times materializes in front of him, which he reads, and he's trying to figure out whether humans haven't been there and are torturing him or it's aliens doing it. And it has an excellent ending to it, a really excellent surprise ending, The Squirrel Cage, which was part of the new wave writing that came into England swing science fiction. Um, now, finally, I come to Kurt Vonnegut. And the chronic chronosynclastic infundibulum, and so it goes, hi ho. And so it goes is his characteristic phrase that he uses in a number of his novels, in particular Slaughterhouse Five and Breakfast of Champions. And hi ho is a repeated expression that he uses in his novel Slapstick, um, uh, where uh, we have uh, uh, the memoirs of the last president of the United States. Now, what about Kurt Vonnegut? Well, Kurt Vonnegut was in World War II, was captured by the Nazis, was a prisoner of war in Dresden when Dresden was bombed and destroyed. And that image stuck in his head forever. And he eventually wrote about it, turned it into science fiction in the novel Slaughterhouse-Five. But he wanted to be a writer, but he struggled with it. He was successful to a degree, and uh, he published Player Piano, which is about a future world that's been automated, Mother Night, which is about a uh, ex-Nazi uh, who uh, uh, is, is uh, um, uh, uh, trying to work himself back into society. But then he hit a stride with The Sirens of Titan, where we have a character who uh, is a, a, a rich person who goes into outer space and gets drawn into the chronosynclastic infundibulum, which is a place where you can see past, present, and future, and all different points of view are equally correct. 
where the idea of a singular truth disappears and reality in its entirety gets presented to you. And we have a character who ends up landing on the moon Titan, where he meets an alien from the planet Trelfalmador, who's been stranded there because his spaceship broke down. And um, he's waiting for a part to fix his spaceship. And the aliens from Trelfalmador who have sent him there have manipulated human history so that we would eventually make the missing part. And it's where the comedy of, of uh, Monaghan really starts to come out. And Trelfamador is gonna come up again. He wrote Cat's Cradle, which was another one that got nominated for uh, a Hugo along with Simons of Titan. And in Cat's Cradle, we have a crazy scientist who was involved in the creation of the atomic bomb. And then he creates this uh, substance called ice, um, Ice nine, is that what it is? Uh, I think it's ice nine. And ice nine is this uh, a form of ice that if you drop it into, uh, I just want to check on that. Yeah, ice nine. Um, if you drop it into water, it turns the water into ice too. And so some of this ice nine gets transported to a Caribbean island where the leader of the island gets it, gets some, uh, gets a piece of it and actually consumes it, turns into ice, falls into the ocean at some point, and all the seas in the world freeze over. And that's the end of us. So it's, it, it, and it's, it's another kind of comical disaster. Then came, God bless you, uh, uh, Mr. Rosewater, Welcome to the Monkey House, which is a collection of short stories. Uh, in one story, Harrison Bergeron, um, he lives in a world where if you have any special talent, you are given various tortures and liabilities. In his case here, a bell rings in your head every 20 seconds, so you'll be equal to everybody else who isn't so talented. Um, and then he achieved world fame all of a sudden with Slaughterhouse-Five. He was accomplished, but he was broke as a science fiction writer. And when he published Slaughterhouse-Five, it went to number one in the New York Times bestseller list. And he had lots of money and lots of recognition and lots of fame after that. And stayed pretty much depressed for the rest of his life, by the way, too. And Slaughterhouse Five was his effort to recreate in fictional form his uh, emotional impressions and impact from World War II and the bombing of Dresden. And it's about a semi-autobiographical semi character, Billy Pilgrim, who comes unstuck in time. That is, he's drawn into the chronosynclastic infundibulum. And he appears at different points in his consciousness, in his life, jumping back and forth. And there's part of his life, which he experiences over and over again, where he's on this alien planet being watched by the Trail Famadorians who are talking to him about um, uh, how to, what the meaning of life is and how to find a purpose in it all and the universe is going to end and they already know how. And mixed together with that is scenes from Dresden and the bombing of Dresden. And his style by this time has evolved to something very distinctive which is he writes in short, clear, black humor, conversational kind of language while he's always, as he puts it, smoking his Paul Mall cigarettes. <clears throat> At one point he sued Philip Morris because uh, he uh, said that on the cigarette packages, he said he would die from the cigarettes and he was in his eighties and he was still alive. So something was, you know, he was suing them for that. But going back to Slaughterhouse Five, Slaughterhouse Five was made into a very good movie that I feel pretty much captures the uh, feeling of uh, in the uh, in the book, um, and um, it it sold over a million copies, and like I said, it hit number one in the New York Times bestseller list. It's one of the biggest selling science fiction novels ever, and um, indeed, it's one of my two favorite new wave science fiction novels. Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse Five. 
He kept writing after that. Uh, Breakfast the Champions, which he includes lots of doodles in, and he has a picture of an anus in it. And he also has uh, the comment and nonsense of strength, Galapagos, where we descend into stupid but adapted uh, uh, humanoid sea lions, slapstick, which is uh, an end of the United States scenario uh, written by the last president of the United States between time and Timbuktu, which they turned into a movie, and Hocus Pocus and Time Quake, which came toward the end, all of them being comical and at the same time rather depressing commentaries on life. Uh, they're the kinds of books that you both cry and laugh at at the same time. And he's very witty. He was always very witty. And he achieved tremendous success as a uh, science fiction writer. And in fact, I would highly recommend, if you haven't seen it, and it just came out this year, a movie in which he is in, Unstuck in Time, which is a kind of biography, autobiography of Vonnegut. Um, and and, and it, it was created by uh, an individual who was friends with Vonnegut for uh, decades and took lots of films of him telling he was going to make a movie. And he finally made the movie, but he didn't make the movie of Vonnegut until after Vonnegut had died. Um, but it's an excellent movie of um, uh, Kurt Vonnegut, the man, and his career and his history. Now, the novel that I think was the best new wave novel of the 60s and early 70s was written by, by John Brunner. And John Brunner was a British science fiction writer. And he was a, uh, a very prolific writer of uh, science fiction space operas in the uh, 1950s into the 1960s. In fact, he was a child progeny just like Delaney was and Brunner published his first science fiction novel, published it when he was 17. And in the early 1960s, he finally got nominated for some awards, Squares of the City, and The Whole Man, which were nominated, didn't win for Best Novel of the Year in Science Fiction. And then in um, 1968, he published Stand on Zanzibar. And Stand on Zanzibar begins with another one of these memorable opening lines. And it's six Papa a Mama for the happy people, keeping it straight and steady on the old Greenwich mean time. How mean can time get? You tell me. Hmm? Stand on Zanzibar is a novel of our times written 60 years ago. It is the most prescient and accurately predicting vision of the world we live in today that anybody created back in the 1950s or 60s. <clears throat> it is an immense novel. It has four different tables of contents. It, its title derives from the idea that if population were to in keep increasing from the 60s, by the year 2010, or 2000, what is it that this takes place in? 2010, um, there would be 7 billion people on the earth. But you could fit 7 billion people standing side to side on the island of Zanzibar, working out the figures of it. And so the image here is of people crowded together. It's filled with news items. There's a computer which continually spits out facts about this world. There's a sociologist who keeps commenting on this world. While this is going on, there's a storyline to it as well too. There is the invention of an immense amount of slang and uh, um, and there's predictions of affirmative action, genetic engineering, Viagra, the collapse of Detroit, TV satellites, in-flight videos, gay marriages, laser printing, electric cars, the decriminalization of marijuana, and the decline of tobacco. 
it is a collage of 700 pages. It's amazingly impressive as a work of intellect. It has the inventiveness of the new wave, that is the writing, as you can see from that opening uh, line there, the writing style of experimenting and playing around with styles to go beyond the linear and throw in lots of different associations and illusions. It's set in New York and um, it's a real critique of the trend of overpopulation that's going on in the world today. But it's also a very prescient vision of all of the craziness and nutsiness and information overload that we're all in right now. It is the best vision of the new wave of the collapse of Western civilization. But it sort of hits the nail on the head of where we are. And he wrote four what John Kluge called part, uh, novels in the Quartet of Dreadful, Dreadful Warnings. After Zanzibar, he wrote The Jagged Orbit, The Sheep Look Up, and The Shockwave Writer. The Sheep Look Up is often seen as his most bleak and effective novel. I think Stan Zanzibar is his best. But The Sheep Look Up is a story about the future in which pollution has just destroyed human reality in, in animal life and ecology as well. But uh, I do think that this was the best thing representative as well of new age writing, uh, new wave, I keep saying new age, uh, uh, writing of the uh, 1960s. And if you, you, know, you wanna sit down and you wanna read something that's really gonna overstimulate you, challenge your mind and just throw you into this crazy, nutsy, super saturated reality that we sometimes feel like we live in. This is the book to read. So that sums it up for today. Uh, and I talked about the uh, transition into the new wave, into the new culture from the 1950s, how the new wave was associated with our new culture, both a reflection of it and contributed into it, how, how it started over in Great Britain with New Worlds and Moorcock and Ballard and Merrill and all this, and then moved over to the United States Spin Red actually publishing over there, but then uh, being an American writer, taken up at, uh, Harlan Ellison being the champion of New Wave over here, and Zelazny, the poet and uh, lyrical mythic writer, Farmer, the creative, inventive, and pornographic one, Delaney, the scholar, uh, Silverberg, the um, uh, immense production of stuff, Dish, very dark, and is, uh, uh, but at the same time, very fascinating. And then at the end, we have Kurt Vonnegut uh, breaking into popular culture, breaking down the barrier between science fiction and popular literature, although he didn't like to be called the science fiction writer, um, with uh, Slaughterhouse-Five and his other funny novels. And then finally, John Brenner, who um, uh, wrote, uh, I think, the uh, masterpiece of that era, uh, stands on Zanzibar, as well as a, a lot of other stuff. So that ends it for today. I probably went over, uh, but we can, um, uh, let's see, uh, pause, share.